Good morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for attending today's Refinitiv event, Riders on the Storm Table Talk, Investment Resilience to Deliver Alpha. My name is Detlef Glow, and I will be your host and moderator for today. Before we begin, let's cover <clears throat> before we begin, let's cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen, you may find multiple widgets for you to use. All are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your screen space. <clears throat> if you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A widget. We will try to answer these during the session. <clears throat> but if we run out of time, they will be answered later via email. Please be ensured that we will capture all questions. <clears throat> you can book a free trial for Lipper using one of the widgets. Additional materials are available in our resource list. <clears throat> Please download those if you, might, if you may find them useful. You can find out more about our speakers via the speakers BIOS widget for the best viewing experience. We recommend closing any programs or browser sessions running in the background. This will help to preserve your bandwidth. The webcast is being streamed, streamed through your computer. So for the best audio quality, please make sure your computer speakers or headset volume is turned up. Some networks cause slides to advance more slowly than others. So logging off your VPN is recommended. If your slides are not progressing, push F5 on your keyboard, Command R on, on Mac, to refresh the page. We value your feedback, so please do complete the pop-up survey at the end of the webcast. We will be recording today's session. An on-demand version of this webcast will be shared in the coming days and can also be assessed using the same audience link that was sent to you today. <clears throat> As this table talk is part of the Refinitiv Lipper Fund Awards communication, we choose investment professionals from fund and asset management companies who have won a Refinitiv Lipper Group Award in multiple jurisdictions this year for the panel. I'm honored to introduce our speakers. First of all, Shokat Bunglavala, who is Head of Portfolio Solutions Multi-Asset, EMEA and Asia Pacific at Goldman Sachs. Secondly, Bertrand Rocher, who is Fixed Income Portfolio Manager at Mirova. And last but not least, Didier St. Georges, who is Head of Portfolio Advisors at Carmignac. <clears throat> Looking back on the year 2020, it can be said that no investor has seen such a year before, even if one looks back to the Great Depressions or the World Wars I and II. The year started off with fears about possible war between North Korea and the US, an upcoming trade war between the US and China, and a possible hard Brexit. In a normal year, these geopolitical tensions would have put enough pressure on the markets to cause a major downturn. But in mid-February, the coronavirus, which has been seen as a local problem in China before, was detected in more and more countries around the world, and finally, caused the COVID-19 pandemic. Governments around the globe closed their borders, economies, and societies to prevent the spread of the virus. These lockdowns led to a major downturn in the equity markets in March, and an additional sell-off in other liquid assets as investors wanted to protect their money. Within these market conditions, the price for oil went below zero for the first time in history. That being said, the governments did not only introduce lockdowns, they also released fiscal stimulus to support companies and residents and to cushion the expected economic downturn. In addition to these relief packages, central banks around the globe restarted to increase their quantitative easing programs to keep the liquidity in the markets up. Altogether, the amounts that have been spent for all the relief packages from, from the different institutions globally reached a level that has never been seen before. As a result, the securities markets returned in general to a normal pattern, 
while equity markets around the globe rallied and hit new all-time highs. In addition to this scenario, the winners of a Refinitiv Lipa Fund Award in 2021 had also to master the increased volatility in Q4 2018. This means our 2021 winners had to navigate uncharted territory successfully twice to be on top of their respective peer groups. With regards to this, I'm sure that our audience is keen to hear how you and your teams were able to overcome these uncertain markets and to produce alpha for our investors. So let's start with Shokot, which were the key drivers for your success over the last three years. Sure, thank you, Detlev, and um, hello, everyone. So we're multi-asset managers, so we had a, a range of drivers, and perhaps I'd highlight four key things. Firstly, our asset allocation process itself, which is all about diversifying across a range of return sources, which has been very valuable. This is about blending developed markets with emerging markets, large cap with small cap, investing in across the whole fixed income and credit spectrum from investment grade to high yield to emerging markets, as well as invested in listed real assets like real estate and infrastructure. That's enabled us to focus on a core um, of strong risk adjusted returns. Secondly, looking beyond bonds for risk mitigation. So we've incorporated tail risk hedging strategies, which pay out when there are significant macro shocks particularly where short-term interest rates um, fall. But we've also got liquid alternative strategies, such as trend following or momentum, which have been additive given their negative correlation to equities during stress periods. Thirdly, dynamically tilting the portfolio as we navigate through the cycle, look at the relative attractiveness of equities versus credit and credit versus bonds, but also taking advantage of shorter-term market dislocations. And then finally, there's security selection, which has also been a key driver as we've sought to take advantage of both the significant dispersion that's occurring within sectors as well as industries, but also taking advantage of the big major mega trends that we're seeing play out, particularly those that relate to the changing patterns of consumption that are driven by the millennial consumer that certainly widened and accelerated during this past year, but also technological advancement, including that in the healthcare space, and of course, environmental sustainability. Now, all four of those drivers were very much in evidence last year as we navigated through both the initial shock in Q1, as well as the subsequent recovery. And I'd highlight our macroeconomic hedging strategy, which invests in short-term interest rate options, that contributed very strongly, particularly as the Fed lowered its funds rate down towards zero in response to the macro shock. Our trend following strategy posted positive returns whilst equities were down 30% and thus provided very effective capital protection. We reduced our exposure to equities during the worst period of the drawdowns. We saw not only elevated levels of risk, but significant stresses in credit markets and liquidity. But that was met with this unprecedented stimulus that you mentioned from central banks through monetary policy and asset purchase programs, which was instrumental in unlocking credit markets and then government supported with significant fiscal relief packages that reduced the tail risk that was impacting equities. We sought to take advantage of that by adjusting our credit positioning, moving into the lower credit quality cohort in the single B to triple B space that we felt as though it added some significantly attractive relative value that contributed strongly. And then finally, in the latter part of last year and going into this year, as the macroeconomic environments improved with vaccine rollout, efficacy of the vaccines, we've moved to a much more pro-risk posture. And within that, we've sought to lean into the more value and pro-cyclical areas of the market, such as financials and energy and industrials, which you would expect to continue to outperform the broader market during this recovery phase. Thank you. So, um, as you said at the beginning, you have a broad diversified portfolio. Is the diversification of the portfolio also a part of the risk management you do, you're doing? 
Yes, absolutely. So essentially what we're looking to do is to take advantage of various drivers of return, but also various areas of risk mitigation. So we don't just concentrate on bonds. Supplementing bonds with um, alternative strategies as well as tail risk hedging strategies, we find very valuable in managing downside risk. And that's particularly important when you're facing significant macro shocks like we did last year. Thank you. Didier, do you have any enhancements to what Chopwat just mentioned? Bertrand, would you like to give a comment? Oh, yes, sorry. I thought you were talking to Didier. So uh, thank you for the question, Douglas. Yeah. No, well, there are some similarities with what Shokat and his teams have done at Mirova uh, in the sense that we also relied pretty much on selection and, if I may say, on a sort of flexibility uh, between, well, long-term thinking, we are doing sustainable research, so we try to think long-term, and ability to ignore, oh, yes, short-term signals that the market was sending. Well, you mentioned especially the crisis of March or February, March 2020. At that time, we observed the market and said, okay, a lot of market players are panicking and they are losing, let's say, uh, the ability to think in uh, a longer-term horizon. We will fix to all six months, one year, three year horizon, and through a selection of assets, which is largely done through uh, ESG screening. As you may know, Mirova is focusing only on ESG and with huge resources putting in that, all the processes start with ESG. So we had confidence in our selections. We just tried to rein in and to ignore short-term signals and to invest at the right time on names that we long-term believed were anyway producing value. So it helps us on both the equity and the fixed income side. During the helm of the crisis when everything was well, downward, we just resisted. We didn't want it to, uh, let's say, sell paper. And we knew that by doing this, we will prepare the ground for market performance in the coming weeks. Um, what is important also in what Chuck had uh, told to everybody is that we needed at some point to figure out which values would outperform. Once everybody understood that there would be a recovery and that public authorities would, would intervene massively and maybe that people would start splashing out the cash savings they had accumulated over the lockdown and curfews, then we had to rapidly adapt. This is why we made a choice pretty similar to what Goldman Sachs did, if I understood the shock at well we try to identify which cyclical values would benefit from new trends. And this is something we did as early as in April uh, 2020 uh, across the whole asset class. We also tried also to dig into uh, some, let's say in the fixed income part, huh, to dig into the capital structure of the bond market, i.e. trying to identify and select some Tier two, for example, from banks uh, to capture some performance. And that was pretty. So if I had to sum it up, it's a mix of long term thinking and flexibility that help us a lot. This is our style. We trust one, believe in, uh, in uh, well, let's say, active management, and we're still confident this will deliver value. And if that left you have looked at uh, for performance and the way we did performance for the first five months of the year of 2021, we still implement this kind of, uh, of things. And one last thing maybe to well, to discuss on is to mention that at Mirova, we believe that if you want to earn money uh, through your portfolio or your investments, you have to accept the idea to lose a little bit from very short period of time. This is in those period of time when everything seems um, to go bad, that you built up your future performance. You mentioned, for example, the last quarter of 2018, 
uh, in 2018, we decided to go long on credit for all fixed income portfolios or to go long on some equity values for all equity portfolios because we knew after the market crash there would be a significant rally all over 2019. And this is what happened. So, well, this is what we did and this is what we will continue to do. I hope it answers your question, Detlef. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Bertrand. So, um, you said you have to be able to bear a bit of risk to make money on, on capital markets, and that's your, your philosophy. Um, and you showcase that not only this year, but also after the downturn in Q4 2018, right? Yep. Yes. Yes. We were more or less, we knew we had what we needed in the portfolio. That was an advantage at the same time. Thank you very much. Didier, what, which were the key drivers for your success over the last three years? I think there might be a technical problem with Didier's line. So, Bertrand, you just said Mirova is a an asset manager who really looks into ESG um, criteria. So how do you integrate these criteria within your investment analysis and risk management process? Okay. So Mirova was created well, almost 10 years ago with only one goal, doing ESG, be it on equity, be it on fixed income, or on infrastructures. So this is really the core engine of our market performances and of our uh, asset management of portfolios. So we do not really integrate ESG because I have to do sort of a one stop there that left if you allow me, but you know that with the success of ESG, everybody now is claiming or contending that uh, they do ESG. So which means a lot of very different things in fact. So what we do at Mirova, it's the starting point. I mean, in the sense that all 12 uh, people, all 12 ESG analysts are screening all the universities we want to invest in. First, they are uh, a combination of former consultants, of engineers, of former equity uh, sell side analysts, and they are specialized by sectors. One is specialized, for example, on mobility, another one on energy, another one on transportation. And we, thanks to their know-how, we exactly know how the companies, the issuers, or the companies from an equity point of view, are aligned or not with a transition from what we call a high-carbon economy towards a low-carbon economy. And this means if you understand me well, this means that we do not only analyze ESG from a risk perspective, but also from an opportunity perspective, which is far more important. We try to put the money of our clients on companies or issuers that we think are adapted to the low carbon economy because we basically think these are the ones who will the most benefit from this environmental and social transition because this environmental and social transition is basically an economical transition. So all our process, to be brief, all our processes start with an ESG screening and once or 12 ESG analysts have built up their list of names that are eligible to our portfolio and there's no complacency with that, we do not do best in class. We only invest in the companies which we think are presenting a decent amount of opportunities from a near point of view. Once they have done their job, then the portfolio managers can try to implement those names within their portfolio, be it on the equity or on the fixed income, uh, in the fixed income side. This is once again something that is uh, well, very valuable. It provides us with a pretty decent performance. You have uh, observed that, that left. And, um, what I can say as a final word is that there are so many ways of doing ESG that to some extent it doesn't mean anything nowadays. Uh, it's kind of victim of its own success as the ESG trend. So we do not um, 
consider everybody is doing ESG exactly the way we do, but we have a lot of confidence in the way we do it. And everything is based upon something very basic, very simple, um, is that the world is changing very rapidly. We are in a transition period, not the very first one the humankind has faced, but in this transition period, you need to really do active management to understand how things will, will evolve because, because the rules of the game are basically changing. And this is why ESG helps us sometimes detect trends in advance of our competitors. And, and if I may give an example of that, and I conclude with that, it's, you know, that on the credit market, Volkswagen was such a big issuer. And every house is in Paris, London, everywhere in worldwide, had Volkswagen positions within their portfolio, not Mirova. Not because of the credit analysis, but because of all ESG analysts on Volkswagen who just decided that Volkswagen was not eligible to, the, to our portfolio. So when the diesel scandal occurred or was revealed in September 2015, we were one of the few houses, credit houses, not to have any penny in Volkswagen. This is an example of illustrating how ESG research by his own uh, tools, by his own methodology, can produce some interesting signals for for portfolio managers. Yes, so does that also imply that uh, using an ESG screening can be reduce the risk in the portfolios? Yes, yes, if you do it properly, once again, some of our great competitors are doing a ESG another way. So it's okay, Sometimes some of them buy, for example, the data from uh, providers and then try to, to make a few tricks to implement them in, into a portfolio, into their portfolio, sorry. At Mirova, we really pay attention to the fact that we don't want to invest in companies that are doing a terrific job, uh, i.e. a job very adapted to the former economy but that will probably not have the resources to uh, be a winner in the new economy. Uh, and for that, uh, what we have observed over the past years, it's that finally, and I hope the Volkswagen example was a, a white way to illustrate that, uh, we, by doing properly the job internally on ESG, you can avoid being exposed to companies that finally find it very hard to adapt to new conditions. Um, and we consider that traditional economic trickle or let's say credit analysis or risk analysis cannot, cannot always detect all the signals that are necessary to avoid some risks. And in these cases, ESG analysis properly executed really, really helps and reduce uh, your risk uh, levels. Yes. Thank you. Um, Didier, do we have you back? Can you, can you hear me now? Yes, perfectly. So, Didier, oh, would right. you mind to give our audience uh, the recipe for your secret sauce to be so successful over the last three years? <laughs> yes, uh, thank you. Uh, and actually, it's interesting. You said that these were uncharted territories uh, but if you remember the uh, you know the uh, internet bubble bursting in 2000 was uncharted territory uh, at the time uh, you know clearly the 2008 great financial crisis was uncharted territory and and every time you know risk management is is not about using recipes it's, it's about being able to understand uh, what is happening and, uh, and for the you know, past uh, more than 30 years at Carmignac, basically the, the mandate, the moral mandate we've had with our clients you know, has been twofold. One is uh, to generate long-term performance, and that's where alpha generation comes in. That's where ESG uh, investment makes sense. Uh, maybe you know, 10, 20 years ago, we didn't call it ESG, uh, but uh, those uh, non-financial criteria are essential to long-term performance, to alpha generation, uh, and that's one one part of uh, of the mandate. But the other part, and, and, and that's the topic of the discussion, I guess, is you know, how to make sure that 
uh, along the way, a financial crisis doesn't wipe out all these alpha creation of the clients. And, and that's where uh, at Carmignac, we, we sort of uh, uh, you know, made our mark by protecting our clients' assets when there would be a, a crisis. And, and again, uh, every time is different. You know, this time around, uh, you know, the past uh, year or so was about uh, understanding what uh, an exponential uh, propagation is. And in that sense, it was not so different from 2008. You know, financial crisis uh, tends to spread in an exponential way as well. Uh, that, that was virtual this time around. The viral propagation was, of course, uh, real. But it is the same idea. And when you have an exponential uh, movement, uh, most of the time, market players, governments uh, uh, are behind the curve. You know, the, the human mind tends to be uh, moving in a linear way and tends to underestimate the speed of an exponential propagation. So it was really understanding the nature of that. We were global investors, so when we, we saw that happening in China, uh, you know, it felt to us that everybody in Europe, in the U.S., thinking that it would necessarily remain regional, uh, was just underestimating the very nature of the of the issue, uh, and so we, we were able to to, to hedge, uh, um, I guess, before many other players. And then the second thing was interesting, and, and I guess that that we could think about that for the future is the fact that uh, what was uh, unique this time around was that the economic uh, collapse was not the result of a crisis. It was the result of the deliberate action by governments to lock down their economies in order to deal with the, uh, you know, the health problem. And so as the governments were the ones taking responsibility in stopping economic activity, then it was quite likely that they would, uh, they would take their responsibility to bring you know, the necessary support to get the economies going again. And so when we, we saw that indeed... Uh, you know, they would be doing that, which we expected, then it, it, it was a signal for us that you know, whatever was needed would be done to bring uh, you know, the markets and the economy back on the, on the, in the right direction. So we were able then to uh, uh, you know, catch this, this performance after the, the month of uh, April, uh, April, May. The thing is that what, what matters in our you know, 30-year experience managing uh, money through periods of crisis is, is to have a very disciplined uh, thought process. Uh, the, the way we're structured at Carmignac is that we have a strategic investment committee, which is just uh, you know, uh, five people around the table, but with a lot of gray hair and, uh, and experience, and trying to understand the nature of the, uh, of the crisis and, and, then, and then deal with it. And that, that's a thought process which is very disciplined and then is followed also by very disciplined implementation uh, which historically you know has a uh, period so uh, it is just a thought process which means that we don't know what the next crisis will be we don't know where it will come from uh, but the next the same idea will be let's understand the nature of the crisis and therefore, let, let's act accordingly and make sure, and again, that's a very important moral mandate vis-a-vis -vis the clients, that uh, all the very hard work to generate alpha over the long term you know, doesn't get wasted because we would uh, you know, suffer a big drawdown in, uh, in a crisis period. So that, that, that's really our philosophy. Thank, thank you very much for that uh, quite extended insight to your, to your process. Um, Shokat, do you integrate ESG criteria within your investment analysis and portfolio management process? Thanks, Detlev. Yes, we, we certainly do. So perhaps worth noting that we've classified a number of our um, Article 8 funds under the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation in the EU, which is all about those that are seeking to promote environmental or social characteristics through their investing and we integrate those considerations right through our process that's essentially related to security selection and through the evaluation of of companies using our own proprietary esg ratings within our fundamental research processes with two principal goals one is to obviously reduce and limit 
carbon intensity through the companies that were investing, but also seeking to affect some degree of social change. The combination of those two objectives does involve, on the first side, some element of, of screening, particularly as it relates to environmental standards to limit carbon intensity. But secondly, it comes through actual engagement. And um, at, at Goldman Sachs, as a very large, active global um, manager, we've got the ability to, to use our voice, use our investing to drive change. And we do that through um, engagement. And that engagement comes through our global stewardship team that engages with companies around the world with respect to our ESG priorities to, to promote positive change. But it also comes through from our bottom-up security selection teams, both on the equity side as well as the, the fixed income credit side, as they review companies, diligence them, go through valuation analysis and investment decisions to unlock stakeholder value, they are also applying um, um, an ESG integrated theme in how they're evaluating companies. We obviously engage with thousands of companies and meet with them um, very regularly. And that aspect in, in terms of driving um, social change could include ensuring diversity as well. We think that having diverse teams will um, unlock broader potential. It gives us a better degree to outperform. We expect our portfolio companies to be able to demonstrate that um, um, as well. The final point I just note on the regulatory standards themselves, which much has been written about, I'd say at a minimum, I think what the new regulatory standards do in the EU is provide the benefit, certainly for ensuring that managers disclose information and provide reporting metrics on their ESG criteria or constraints, particularly to align relative to what they've suggested is occurring in, in portfolios. And we think that's invaluable for investors, both to ensure that they know what they're buying, but secondly, of course, to ensure that they can make an informed judgment as to whether or not it's aligned to their own interests. Yes, yeah, thank, thank you very much. Um, as I asked that question all already to Bertrand, I would like to ask it also to you. Do you think that integrating ESG criteria helps to reduce the risk in your portfolio or to achieve a better risk-adjusted return? Um, Shokar, this mm -hmm. one was, was for you. If you you were you were saying you were integrating into ESG into your portfolio management processes, and you are strongly engaging with the companies. Um, from your point of view, do you s see or witness that integrating those criteria and using this um, engagement approach helps to produce better risk-adjusted returns? Yes, yeah, so I think it's important to, to probably think about this on two levels. One, when you're thinking about diversified, balanced portfolios, you're investing, obviously, across asset classes. There's mechanisms to ensure that you're focused on capital protection and risk mitigation um, through, through an appropriately diversified um, approach. And then you can incorporate clearly a range of ESG criteria um, as an overlay when you're selecting companies, the critical element of, of ESG is very much related to discerning security selection. Um, and through the combination of both those approaches, um, you can focus clearly on robust risk adjusted returns and managing um, overall portfolio risk, whilst also ensuring that you're aligning to, to a wider ESG philosophy in your selection of, of, of companies. So I think that's the way that we think about managing risk with um, um, with an ESG mindset. Thank you very much. One note to the audience, please enter your questions into the Q&A chat so that we can answer them during the Q&A session. Well, did you, um, we, and, and you talked about this, we, we see a lot of change with regards to sector rotations with an increased speed. We see fast movements between the risk on and the risk off mode of investors. Um, we also witness that um, we ch the change of investment styles, so from growth to value back to growth, 
Uh, how do you avoid drawbacks or take profit from these kind of fast and strong market movements? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I mean, th th there are two angles. One is to make sure that they, they, there is no uh, confusion between risk and volatility. Uh, I think we will all agree that you know the, the, the way to generate performance over the long term is to do really a, a hard work on, on the research side, reach really conclusion which diverge from the consensus, and then and then go for that. But that means that clearly the market will not necessarily you know agree immediately, uh, and then there can be uh, clearly volatility in the short term, and you have to accept it. There's just no way to really do a lot better than benchmarks uh, if you don't accept uh, your short-term volatility. So that, that's one aspect. And, uh, and again, that's very, very different from risk. Risk is about you know, uh, uh, having the possibility of, of losing money in a big way that would really hurt the long-term uh, long performance. Now, when you have this rotation between uh, sectors like, like we've had uh, in the past uh, few quarters or between styles, here it's different. It's about understanding the cycle. Uh, and and the, the one thing that maybe, maybe some investors uh, lose sight of sometimes is that at the same time as you have long-term trends, uh, you have mini cycles. You know, and, and we've had a few over the past 10 years, which look very flat in terms of a you know, general direction. Uh, but in reality, you know, there was a short mini cycle in 2012. There was another one starting in 2018. Uh, and of course, there was one starting last, uh, last April. Uh, and so you have those quite powerful uh, uh, style in sector rotations, which are not really uh, uh, long-term movements. They usually uh, are spread over a couple of years. And this time around, that was, of course, much shorter. Uh, but of course, they, they are still very much worth catching because uh, even if they don't last very long, the divergence between sectors, between styles, uh, can be much stronger than the actual direction of the overall market. So again, we are back to the thought process. One has to be very disciplined about understanding where in a mini cycle you are and therefore adjusting the, you know, the nature of the style of the, uh, the sector uh, construction of a portfolio. So it's, it's all about uh, being very disciplined in the process. Uh, and again, uh, we are always at one stage of the cycle. And one has always to think, where are we in the cycle, even if we have long-term convictions? Thank you very much. Shokat, as you run multi-asset portfolios, I'm pretty sure that you have something to add to what DJ just said. Sure. So, look, we do have momentum-based strategies in our portfolios as well. They're looking to exploit shorter-term shifts in markets, and that's across all core asset classes. That could be equities, sectors within equities, fixed income markets, currencies and commodities. It's worth noting that clearly um, a, just a, a natural uh, behavior of things getting overbought or oversold um, um, it, over the short term, and that's something that can be taken advantage of through through these momentum-based strategies, um, and we certainly have that within our portfolios. But as it relates to the overall macro theme and um, this, this view around reflation and therefore the rotation that we're seeing into the value and pro-cyclical areas of the market that have lagged up until the, the most uh, recent two quarters, we'd expect to see this play out over a much longer period. And whilst we're likely to see temporary drawbacks or causes in this rotation, particularly given there are clearly risks in the outlook around the spread of the virus, virus mutations, the pace of vaccine rollout, all obviously risks. We wouldn't look to continuously time the market here with this um, um, broad rotational theme. We'd rather seek to retain an overall pro-cyclical posture and ride out any short-term bouts of volatility. Thank you very much. A short question on that. Do you think that these trends made it harder to navigate the, the markets? Shokot, what, what do you think? Is it, is it now harder to navigate those markets or 
are these trends just just the common volatility? Sure, I think a lot of this is obviously down to evaluating, as Didier mentioned, where you think you are in the in in the cycle. This. We've gone through a process where we entered late stages of an expansion phase um, and then got hit by an extraordinary exogenous shock. This was very different to what we saw in 2008, where there was a buildup of, um, of, of, of debt, there was um, um, housing bubbles, there's a pretty significant impact on the overall financial system that took a number of years to resolve. This time we were hit with a, um, a broad macro shock, economies needed to close down and you're um, you dealt with now uh, um, a cycle that's based on um, reopening and therefore judge and then as a result, consequentially, an extraordinarily uh, sudden and sharp drawdown of the fastest drawdowns of over 30 percent that we've seen um, since the 1950s. But commensurately, just given the extent of the policy response, um, the fastest recovery in, in, in markets as well. And that goes to, to the point that this is very much about um, now reopening economies, evaluating where we are, looking at um, macroeconomic data, um, improvements in the labor market, um, which we're now seeing. So in, in some ways, we think that the typical phases of the cycle, which are um, related to uh, rollover, turnaround, um, recovery and then back to expansion phase, we think are still intact. It just happens to be that we're that we're going through those um, very swiftly. But we certainly think that the overall cycle is still intact and we're going through a recovery period and we'd expect to see continued improvement in economic data. And we're certainly seeing that um, when you look at um, labor market improvements, retail sales, manufacturing data and global PMI data, which continues to improve around the world, notwithstanding um, those risks that we mentioned. Thank you very much. Bertrand, um, you mentioned at the beginning that you were um, moving around within bond segments um, and even on the um, different segments of the bonds of one issuer. So how does the increased speed of rotations impact your portfolios on the bond side? I wouldn't say it really impacts our portfolio from the fixing some side. Uh, the rotation was something we more or less anticipated. As Didier said, uh, it was pretty clear uh, at the helm of the crisis that political authorities, uh, in broad sense, I mean, including central banks, would have to intervene and intervene massively. And that the cash savings, I just mentioned that, but I, I reiterate, the cash savings accumulated by population would be translated would translate into consumption so this is what has driven uh, let's say rotation and rightly so uh, so it's not impacting in the sense that it creates some opportunity you just have to to try to track once again it's all about trying to ignore the face or the fake signals and to focus on the right signals and rotation to some example, to some extent, is just a result of uh, those combination of fake and uh, right uh, signals. So for, for us, it was uh, building up much more opportunities than implementing risk. But now, for the future, uh, the point is that everybody has understood what was happening. Uh, we wrote a report in early January, I think, uh, about inflation blips because it, we thought it was it would be the the main theme of 2021, but at the time we were not alone to talk about it, but not that numerous to, to mention it anyway, or to position the portfolio accordingly. And now everybody has understood that. So we are in a position then where rotation and all these thematics, uh, rotation towards cyclicals, value versus um, uh, long-term uh, uh, investors, all these thematics have been understood by the market. And so the question for now is to understand what comes next, uh, I mean, in the second part of 2021 and beyond. And for that, we consider that rotation uh, will continue, in fact, because you can see that markets are panicking from some time to time, and all of a sudden, following all the same trends, the same trends, uh, 
sometimes with late comers trying to imitate those who have anticipated and well uh, identified the trend. So this is where we are uh, as of today, trying to figure out what will come next now that everybody or almost everybody in the market has more or less understood uh, what was to happen now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So another trend that we have seen is the move towards passive investment. Um, and this trend has emerged over the last two decades. Um, so it's not just coming out of nothing. Um, and I know, DTA, as, as an active manager at Kamenyak, you've got a clear view on this. Um, so I would like you to start to answer the question, do you think that passive products are a threat to active managers or the markets overall? Um, yeah, as you say, I, as, as pure active fund managers, I, I, I would have a view on that. Um, ETFs are, are, are very cheap instruments, uh, and therefore, you know, they can be useful tools when, uh, when you want to build uh, portfolios. Uh, however, one has to realize that, uh, as you said, they, they really uh, grew exponentially again. Uh, or at least very strongly over the past uh, decade, uh, you know, partly because um, basically equity markets and markets in general were driven by one absolutely overwhelming factor, which was uh, falling interest rates, you know, pushing up the valuation of all financial assets, and therefore trying to generate alpha over and above, you know, this very supportive. Uh, uh, direction by market was was not really so attractive uh, to justify uh, you know much uh, management uh, fees uh, and so it was natural to go for just uh, passive uh, investments and and clearly you know, this has attracted you know massive uh, massive assets now I would argue that um, going forward um, you know it is very very uh, debatable and maybe we can discuss that later. Uh, as to whether the same driver could uh, could continue uh, to be so important, you know, in interest rates uh, you know certainly cannot fall much further than, than they have, uh, and therefore I would argue that even if it is going to be very difficult, uh, I would think in the coming years um, active fund managers will have the opportunity uh, to show that it is absolutely necessary to have a, a big share of your performance driven from alpha generation, uh, as opposed to just you know, playing the beta and playing the trends uh, over uh, the trends of the markets themselves. So I think they are, they are tools, they, they have their use. We understand why uh, they have taken you know, such big chunks of the, uh, uh, you know, the assets market. Uh, I think going forward, um, they, they will have a lot more difficulty uh, you know, showing that they are an effective way to you know, generate returns uh, on, uh, on both bonds and, and equity markets. Thank you. Shokat, what do you think about the um, increase of passives in the, in, in the securities markets? Do you think that it is a threat to the to the industry or for active managers or the markets overall? Thanks, Dele. Yeah, so no, no, we wouldn't see them as a threat. As multi-asset managers, we obviously see ETS, passive index funds, etc., as all very valuable tools in constructing our balanced portfolios. They enable um, cheaper diversification, but they also actually enable very effective implementation of tactical positioning and, and short-term adjustments to portfolios, which is worth noting that the relative richness or attractiveness of alpha can differ across different asset classes. For instance, there may well be more opportunities in small cap and EM and in high yield than there are in perhaps US large cap, and therefore passive vehicles and, and instruments um, provide um, the ability to more easily allocate and delineate within within portfolios, which is which is very valuable. The final point I would note, though, is that we have gone through clearly a very challenging period um, for, for active managers over a number of years, and we saw that reverse pretty spectacularly um, last year, um, given 
um, the, the, the opportunities that come from wider dispersion, um, a lower degree of correlation across companies, and we're expecting that to continue. We think it's going to be a much more fertile ground and period for active managers, given the likely dispersion that arises from the pandemic, as well as the recovery. Um, looking and determining which companies reorganize their balance sheets with the debt that they've taken on um, in this most recent period and how they adapt to a new environment, seek revenues, um, improve earnings as well as overall profitability provides for that discerning investor and that stock picker to take advantage of that. And as a result, we've certainly sought to lean more into active in our portfolios um, through this period. Thank you very much, Shokat. Bertrand, there's a lot of discussion around the raise of passives in the bond space. Do you see passive instruments as a threat to uh, the bond portfolio management, the active bond portfolio management, or the uh, uh, bond markets overall? No, not really. All in all, at the end, it's not a threat for the reasons Didier and Shokat uh, have mentioned, but also because it forces us all, uh, as active managers, to be better and to be to stay ahead of the curve all the time. So, well, it requires a lot of work, of course, because it's not that easy to to think uh, ahead of the market. But at the very least, we know that ETFs are there, and that all uh, dedication toward our clients is to provide them with performance ahead of that of ETFs. It forces us, in fact, to justify very basically the prices we are charging them uh, what we can say is uh, of less uh, enthusiasm versus regarding this ETF is the weight they can have for very small moment of time in the market when they all act in the same direction and really weigh on price uh, be it on the positive or on the negative side and this can create some market distortions, which can be a problem for some, for some of our clients from time to time. And we are, in those periods, forced to show our clients we are okay to seize the opportunity created by the distortion. So we consider this is pretty much logical that ETFs have expanded so rapidly over the past year, especially in a low-rate environment. But we think that given the fact that we anticipate higher rates, not spectacularly higher, but higher rates anyway for the coming years, uh, for long-term reasons uh, I don't have the time to, to, to elaborate on, but we think ETF might enter maybe a less dynamic period. Let's see. It's very interesting to, to see this um, industry becoming so important. Uh, really, once again, it forced all active managers to, to show they are, they are worth the price they charge to their clients. This is the way we see it anyway. Thank you very much, Petron. That was a very powerful answer to, to that question. There have been no questions from the audience so far entered in the Q&A chat. So if you want to raise a question, please do it now as we are now moving on to the final question and i can't let such a panel of experts go without asking the question what is your outlook for the securities markets for the next 12 to 24 months and uh, i think we should start with show cut on this one and thanks Detlef. so look on the outlook um we're obviously likely to see above trend um, global economic growth this year um, as well as next year as we expect to see these vaccine programs um, continue got clearly very supportive um, fiscal policy that's continuing to drive the economic recovery so we'd expect to see the us lead the pack um, um, off the back end of a very successful vaccine drive as well as a, a, a very robust fiscal package we've seen the most recent round of that with a 1.9 trillion package passed in march and that supported household incomes increased savings rates and that's likely to provide a continued boost to demand as as the economy reo reopens we'd expect to see the eurozone lag the us in terms of the pace of recovery given the infection rates in in, in Europe is still reasonably high. The vaccine program has rolled out um, um, on a slower pace. 
um, given supply as well as take-up issues. But we're still expecting to see robust growth in the second half this year and in, into next. And given our overall expectations on the global economic recovery, we remain positive on equities, both in developed markets and emerging markets. And that view is predicated on um, continued strong expected earnings growth. We've seen that in Q4. We've seen that continue through the reported earnings in Q1 in the US, in, in Europe and in Japan. And as a result, we think equities offer an attractive risk premium relative to bonds. Now, it's worth noting that market valuations are high, both on an absolute basis and certainly relative to history. But when you look at the relative measures of equities versus bonds, when you're looking at earnings, um, yield, dividend yields, free cash flow yields in equity markets relative to bonds, they don't look as stretched. And it's important to look at those things on a relative basis and certainly in the context of the macro environment that we're in. Within credit markets, where we're broadly neutral. We think that Clearly, spreads have tightened pretty significantly with, with the policy support that we've seen, as well as the improved growth backdrop. Um, government bonds and interest rates we find less attractive based on the view that the economy is going to continue to normalize and bond yields are likely to trend higher. And that's going to be compounded by fiscal and monetary policy continuing to remain highly accommodative throughout this year and next. Finally, I would note that the significant rotation that we've seen through Q4 last year that's continued through to this year and in values and pro-cyclical areas of the market, we'd expect to see that continue as well. We've seen small cap outperform the NASDAQ by roughly around 10%. Year to date, we've seen value outperform growth by about 10%. We've seen the equally weighted S&P outperform the market weighted S&P by 5% and financials and energy have outperformed the broader market, coppers hitting highs that we've last seen in around 2012. All of those positive signs around pro-cyclicality, much wider breadth of participation in um, driving equities forward and the improvement in, in macro data lends itself to, I think, a view that the, certainly the market sees sustainability in this recovery. Now, it's worth noting clearly that there's still risks here virus spread, mutations, greater transmissibility of these of these viruses, uh, of this virus, excuse me, could translate clearly to, to interruptions in that recovery. But overall, um, we believe in the sustainability of the recovery. We think there's likely to be further bouts of volatility, but overall expectation of equities continuing to grind higher from here. Thank you very much. Bertrand, what is your expectation for the bond markets over the next 12 to 24 months? Well, we stick to March 2020 uh, outlook. We consider that things are developing very positively and that there's a kind of V-shaped recovery, not uh, spread all over, over all sectors, but a V-shaped recovery still. And that will translate into better results, as we have seen in the first quarter, as Shuket uh, just mentioned. So we are pretty constructive for well, the equity market, especially after the correction we have observed. Uh, for the bond market now and credit, we, we all understand there is, a, let's say, a very low spread, very tight spread for the time being. And that might mean that most of the market have priced in, uh, let's say, the recovery we, we are just talking about. So there's still a bit of potential, but now you have to really, really, really rely on selection to pick up, to cherry pick the names which still offer value and which will really have the ability to further benefit from the current trends. Uh, well, the only thing we we see as a threat to all this very constructive scenario, uh, it's the scenario we built uh, in January 2021, uh, I mentioned a few minutes ago, that is the fact that we were anticipating a rise in commodity prices, a very sharp rise in commodity prices. And what we understand is that it goes beyond just higher prices, but also to accessing resources, to accessing natural resources. Uh, you mentioned the competition between uh, China and uh, the United States. We think it's not only a commercial competition. Uh, it's not all about uh, payments. It's also about accessing resources. And 
we consider this is a threat on the market valuation for the coming uh, maybe a month in the second part of the year. Not a threat with a high probability that it translated to something really damaging, but this is something really, really we are currently monitoring at Mirova to understand what's next. Uh, we already talked about what's next a few minutes ago. For us, uh, well, this is it. So a pretty positive and constructive scenario on profits from companies on the economic environment with a small threat on whether access to natural resources, access to commodities can a little bit uh, from sometimes to times create some distortion. And that's it for all scenarios. Thank you very much. We are just hitting the top of the hour, but I don't want to miss the view from Didier on the next 12 to 24 months before we close this webinar. Yeah, thank you, Detlef. Maybe, maybe you, you regret uh, giving me the, uh, the mic here because I'm going to be a lot less uh, constructive than my colleagues. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid that, uh, uh, yes, indeed, uh, the economic growth is going to continue to be, to be very, uh, very supportive. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, that's not necessarily good news for uh, both uh, uh, equity and credit markets. And I would agree with Bertrand's comment on the, on the credit markets in that respect. But on equities, it's, it's also, a, a, in our opinion, uh, you know, considerable risk that uh, we are going to be faced in the coming uh, 12 to 24 months with a, a material regime change, whereby, as opposed to what we've had you know, in the past decade of uh, markets being driven up by uh, ample liquidity coming from central banks and, and basically a re-rating of, uh, of equity markets, we're going to be faced going forward by um, you know, central banks that will not be in a position to justify nearly as much support as they've supplied over the past years, precisely because the economy you know, won't need it. Uh, and therefore, you know, there is a significant risk, in our opinion, that um, basically Main Street is going to take a bit of a revenge over Wall Street, and there is going to be a, a compression of valuations in, in the equity markets. Uh, so in our opinion, we should not confuse uh, you know, the economic improvement with necessarily uh, you know, a positive message for, for equity markets. So we, we've moved, in our opinion, in a more uh, you know, risky period for, uh, for risk assets. Sorry to end Thanks. on a more, uh, <laughs> on a more uh, sober note. No, it's great. We need to have controversial um, discussions around the markets. Otherwise, uh, the markets would only move in one direction. Um, so there have been no questions for the Q&A um, session submitted. That leads me to the last point. A big thank you to my panelists and a big thank you to everybody in the audience for attending the Refinitiv Table Talk, Riders on the Storm. I hope you have a good day and I wish you a great weekend. Um, talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you.